Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. Um, so I hope that um, uh, so we have talked about a little bit about this TMS one. So that's the code name for this um, paper. So that's the archive link uh, this morning. Then gave an excellent introduction. Um, but do ask repeat questions, right? So uh, ask detailed questions. This is this is a talk for it and. Um, and we'll discuss, so if the question goes into too much detail, we can discuss afterwards. Okay. Okay. Ah. Uh, that works, yeah. All right, so the inspiration of uh, Dev Interp, um, we're taking inspiration from developmental biology. Um, this is um, a paper uh, called Single Cell Reconstruction of Developmental Trajectories um, during zebra, Zebrafish Embryogenesis. So um, Zebrafish is, um, I think it's a, a common model uh, organism um, that biologists study. And this is, um, they collect, collected some data, high dimensional data on how, how the relative proportion of how uh, each gene is expressed. And then you can trace that across a developmental period. Um, and that's a visualization of what um, biologists have been able to do. That's what we want to do. <laughs> um, okay, so, so you have, we, have, we start with um, pluripotent stem cells that develop into specialized um, tissues. Um, so hand, allow me some hand wavy, flowery, poetic language. This is uh, akin to high potential, low complexity population of cells. So it's just all stem cells. Um, high potential in the sense of, in the sense of motor force. Like it is, it, um, there's, um, it, there is a lot of ways for it to, to, to further develop. It wants to change in the environment um, where the usual biology is happening, right? I know that biologists uh, can uh, engineer different environments so that it could sort of go backwards. Um, so we're talking about some environment, right? So that's um, the usual, usual developmental environment, right? So you start with this high potential, low complexity population of cells, and then they develop into um, low potential, doesn't want to change anymore, um, and high complexity one, like, that, like all of you here. I'm pretty sure you're pretty complex. Um, so, <laughs> oh well, yeah. You'd really like at the cell level. You don't want cancer, right? <laughs> so, it's, you know, or, or like sort of over, overly dramatic changes, um, right? Um, so the outcomes uh, of these changes, like the, the high complexity one, even though there, there's many of them, they are um, recognizable or interpretable. Wink, wink. Um, and we give them names like um, skins and nerves and muscles and the, the fact that they, 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 they are one object that, that, that we can give them name and that name makes sense to most people is um, sort of uh, 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 attest to their sort of persistence and uh, coherence of definitions, right? That's the hint to what, our de what we strive to achieve with a definition of phase. Right, so this is going to be an underlying theme of this. So at the back of your mind, in this throughout this talk, you can ask justifiably what is a phase, and I can see a lot of questions in uh, in the in the papers here. What is a phase? We'll try to answer that, maybe. Okay, um, for another source of inspiration, um, just to vary your sources of analogy a little bit, um, this is stellar life cycle. Um, you have um, gas clouds <laughs> develop into, without any external, this is literally the universe, like gas cloud uh, developing into uh, stars and go through different stages of life. Uh, yep, stages of life, we actually call them <laughs> life cycles. Um, and then develop into different things and there are different paths um, depending on the conditions. Uh, so the, uh, different stars have different fate. Um, okay. Less impressive graphics, <laughs> but <laughs> this is what we talk to, we're talking about today in this tiny microscopic system compared to biology and stellar mechanics. Um, 
uh, this is the toy model position, and this is a preview of, um, oh, it's not no longer a preview, right? You've already seen this. But, so, uh, again, using loose languages, um, what, you, what we are seeing here is um, the process, process of learning um, go via, uh, has, has different stages. So on the, on the left, um, that is meant to represent Bayesian learning, where the learning means um, you run through, you, you, start, you collect increasingly more data of the same phenomenon, and then you update your hypothesis um, as, you, um, as you see more data and is more or less confident about one hypothesis versus another. On the right, we have um, play. Um, we have that animation that we have seen. This is uh, learning via SGD, where there is also um, very, very distinct, it also goes through very distinct stages. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Three stages. Okay. Right. Um, and this is the system that we will talk about in detail um, today. Okay, the, the, the theme, the overall, the overall theme is that we want to um, talk about deep, deep neural network learning uh, as if it is developing increasingly complex structures in stages. So, um, uh, simple to complex and in recognizable stages. We'll discuss the theoretical underpinnings um, that we have for certain part of this, um, of this perspective. Uh, we'll, in the context of TMS, and this is why we care about TMS um, for, um, for, for this project, is that we can opera operationalize um, these theoretical um, results into predictions, and then we can run experiments and test those, that test those predictions. Okay, we'll see the results of those experiments. Okay, the, the math part. Um, or just tell me what the phase is. I'm not going to do that. But um, the, the idea is that you should, while, while you're looking at the math part, which we have already run through many, many different times, that's uh, the, the question you should have at the back of your mind is what part of that math sh can correspond to, can hint at properties of what we will call a phase. Okay, SLT setup, um, we will do, we, we have gone through this a lot, so I'm going to specialize the SLT uh, background into, um, specifically for time model superposition uh, for TMS. We have data, we call dn, n, little n is the size um, of the data set, and they are assumed to be ID, so independently, independent and identically sampled from the same distribution, and that, how, what, is, what is that distribution? Well, it's equivalent to telling you how to sample. So each of the data, data point, x, consists of a vectors. Um, so we are looking at a specific setting in uh, toy model superposition where we have maximal sparsity. Meaning this data only consists of one coordinate um, that is non-zero. So every other coordinate is zero except for one. And that coordinate is also uh, randomly sampled uh, from C number of index, where C for column, um, because it's going to be correspond to columns. Um, or another word for it is the input dimension to the neural network that we'll consider later. later. Okay, and that non-zero um, coordinate is going to itself be uniformly sampled from zero and one. Uniform distribution of zero one. The model is going to be, um, yeah. The model is a Gaussian model where, so you run. Did I write it out? Whoops. Okay, wrong, wrong order. Okay, the model is going to be a Gaussian model where you run the input through a function and then you up that output. That function is going to be the neural network, and you output uh, something. And the purpose um, of that neural network is actually to uh, represent something in the feature and uh, represent the input in some feature space and then read it out again. So the loss is, um, the, the, the likelihood um, that the model is going to be um, about reconstruction um, loss. 
So this is a Gaussian model on the, uh, this, is, this looks like a Gaussian model, and, okay, let me do that. So the neural network is um, just a single layer auto, auto encoder, and you um, encode, decode, um, plus B, run it through a ReLU, um, and then the loss, um, also known as the negative log likelihood in the SLT setting, um, exactly looks like the mean square error. So the re reconstruction mean square error, um, because we're using models like that. No, no, that's the, that's the entire network, not much of a network. Right, so uh, wait, okay. So the parameters are, are the weights and bias of that network, that single layer network. And this is how we are going to uh, visualize this tuple, where W is the weight, weight matrix. So the weight matrix will have dimension RC, so R rows, so the number of features you want to compress your input into. And the input uh, and C is the number of columns of W, of the weight matrix uh, is the input features phase. And uh, we are talk, thinking, thinking about compressing um, the feature representation, so R is less than C. And in fact, uh, this is a good place to mention that um, the experiments that we will see is mostly focused on R2C6, so um, two hidden feature space and uh, six input dimensional space. Oh, I should explain the visualization. So, um, so this is a case where, uh, so six columns and W is a two by six uh, matrix. Each column is a vector in R2. So these black bars uh, is, is a vector um, of each of the columns. And um, you can look at the polygon that, that um, six vectors uh, trace out and we visualize, that, visualize those like that. And the bias B is going to be visualized as bar chart on the right hand side here. And if, the, if B is negative, so in this model, the negative and positive bias actually uh, matters because, because of ReLU, if you minus a very negative B, you go into zero, so that distinction is important. And negative bias is going to be represented by red. Minus a very positive B. If you add a very negative B, yes. Thank you. So there is no reason why you draw the polygon as being convex, right? It could be complete. Correct. So I say polygon, um, uh, but regardless of what it is, it's going to be a polygon. Regular or not is uh, another question. I happen to uh, tr be drawing a regular six gon here. Concave as well. It can be concave as well. Okay. Okay. So the other very important object of SLT is the potential energy. Um, we are going to. I think Kaleen correct us. We keep on saying energy last time. This should be potential, potential energy. Um, so it's the effective potential, right? So it's it is actually the expected value of ln um, across multiple different realization of the data. Um, it's the effective driving force behind um, the learning phenomenon. Okay, in this case, this is, um, so the, the loss is the mean square error loss, and the potential energy is kind of the functional L2 distance between, between ID and um, the, the neural network. Okay, um, quickly, important, other important quantities in SLT, the Bayesian posterior, um, where Z and denote the partition function, or also known as the marginal likelihood um, function, uh, ma the marginal likelihood. Um, the, I think it's worth bringing out why it is called that, because it is the likelihood if you marginalize across all parameters of the model. So it's the likelihood of the model by that I mean, if you have two different models with their own parameter space, once you marginalize them, this Z quantity for each of those different models is the likelihood that 
you observe the data if you use model one or model two. Okay, we'll bring that up later again. Later. Say that again. Yes, so I simplified that a little bit. It's the likelihood of the model and the prior. So you can use the same model, you choose a different prior, then this, this thing will change. Um, yeah. Because what is MSE here? Uh, is it, it is the prior? No, MSE is um, the empirical potential, let's say it that way. Yeah. So this, this, is what, this, this is what you assume the, the likelihood of the Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, M the MSE is the, is, the, is the loss, is the um, empirical realization of the potential energy. Um, or the quench version. Yes. Yeah. So on the polygon slide, what do the edges mean? Because the x axis is weight 1. Oh. The y axis is weight 2. Uh, so it's hidden. Yeah, so the x so so w in, in our case is a two is a two by six, so each column is two two D. So um, this is the first entry of that two D vector, and this is the second entry of that two D vector. So it's a R2, uh, so each column is a vector in R2. This is the R2 plane. You plop that vector. But, uh, yeah. You're asking about the boundary. The boundary is just added in so you can see the shape. It's not actually visualizing any data. Oh you mean this this thing? Uh, the, yeah, they just, just add it in so that you can actually see a polygon. It's also because we by counting the number of vertices in complex solids. Yeah, yeah, so the, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 a, it's a visual thing. <laughs> yes. Also, I just wanted to make, maybe you already mentioned this, so like, like, you can also think of this as the activation vectors where they lie because everything is one, because everything is, is in the limit of high sparsity. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know why I forget it. It's in the first slide. Um, this is joint work with Jake, uh, Dan, John Tian, and Susan. And feel free to chime in when I say miss something and say something wrong. Okay. So, and the free energy is defined by us as negative log of Zn because we like additive stuff. And because the theorem is uh, stated as the, it's called the free energy expansion. Um, so I'm not going to go through it again. So we have seen this a lot of time. Um, that's the free energy. Um, I am going to uh, highlight the expected version of the free energy. So if you, if, you ha if you have this quantity, you look at this quantity for many, many different realization of the data set, take the average, um, you get this um, quantity where you have the empirical um, loss becomes the potential energy. Right. So, um, right, and um, the, the random variable here, which is of all the constant order, stochastically of constant order, um, just becomes a constant. Okay, the critical point of the potential is very important. That's the central message of singularity theory of SLT, um, and this is some visceral vis visualization of that. So what is plotted here is you have um, L as a potential, and then you look at the posterior um, corresponding to that L. So by that I mean what I'm plotting is E to the negative N L of W. Okay, so in the first case, we have, uh, um, we have L that is just um, locally sum of squares. So there's, it has two critical points and it is just um, a most, there are non-degenerate critical points. In other words, are, and the name for it is the uh, most critical point. Nothing to do with TMS. Nothing to do with TMS. This is toy visualization, okay? What other things could happen is you could have, um, you could have non-degenerate critical point and Degenerate critical point, degenerate one is more important as, as your n become larger. And not approximable as a And not approximable as a Gaussian distribution. Even though it looks like a dome, you, your Gaussian would be sharper. Well, your Gaussian would look like that. 
And in higher dimension, you could have um, critical points that is not point. They are <laughs> <laughs> definitely not collision. So this is a, this is a line uh, where, where, the, where, the where, the, where the critical set of L um, is, is, uh, is a line. So there is a, um, there is a line of critical set where uh, del L on that is all zero. And you get um, higher dimensional uh, structures that can have degeneracy of their own as well. So we'll talk about degeneracy and these kind of things um, later on in the week as well. Um, but this is highlight what different things could happen and that critical points are important and local geometry of the critical points is what we care about. Okay, cost graining. Um, the background is what Dao Yi think cost graining is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So this, these, uh, sorry. So these visualization is telling us, um, um, is, is also telling us something about. So if you take this as your um, posterior distribution, they localize. Um, so if if you have multiple different disjoint uh, critical sets, you can localize to those sets and analyze the local geometry. Uh, one by one, as um, Dan Horace already talked about uh, this morning. And you can talk about them as if they are submodels. And at the back of your mind, you could, you, could, you could ask those faces. Don't ask me yet. I don't know. Okay. But, okay, so this is the calculations that um, Dan has shown you this morning. But I want to. Um, there. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Let me uh, run through some of it in slightly more uh, detail. So, so Zn is a partition function. Is the integral over. It is this, this integral. And we have seen that this factor um, has concentration in different parts of the parameter space. So let's look at an example where we choose to partition it into two, two pieces, say W1 and W2. So, so same integral. Um, so W1, W2, so let's say we partition it into W1. Um, just, a, just a union, uh, W1, W2. Um, and these are, let's say, open sets so that we can construct a partition of unity. Um, let's call it that row. So same thing, just on um, W2. Okay. So this becomes a sort of the same kind of integral as the original integral, just sort of specialized to W1. And you can think of this as sort of your new um, prior within that space, within W1. So this becomes Zn of W1, capital W2. OK. We will. Because z is equal to negative log of f, uh, sorry, f is equal to negative log of z. <laughs> so this is and well, the reason we care um, represent re represent it that way is because we have the free energy uh, asymptotic, which itself has already has large order, right? So um, while the the point is that the next calculation, you can figure out which one is larger. So let's say there is one that is larger. Let's call it star. And then the rest becomes e to the negative, the difference um, in free energy. And the difference in free energy is using the free energy formula is, well, the first, or the, the 
leading order term is order n. So if you have a difference in the leading order term, um, then, uh, then this thing is e to the negative n um, is of order e to the negative n. So, sorry, this thing is of the, of, of the order e to the negative n. So this thing will exponentially decay, right? Um, if you don't have a difference in first order term, so delta L is zero, then you, uh, and you have a difference in the next order term, which is a log n term, then what is this? So this becomes e to the negative um, delta lambda log n. So this is, um, this is, that's of the order of, uh, of that. This is n to the, so it has, it's a polynomial suppression. So um, if you only have a difference in the log n term, okay, and so on and so forth, right? So uh, this is also a kind of a lesson to point out in terms of if you always assume that you are working in the regular model um, case, so in regular model, your RLCT, your lambda, is always d on two, um, where d is the parameter count. So your delta lambda is always zero. Um, then, um, f so then if you are comparing um, points of the same energy, then you are comparing things at the delta c level, right? So um, the, the phase transition is not as sharp. Um, and even though it can possibly occur. So C would, delta C would in, in involve something like the prior at different parts of your parameter space or the, the, the volume of that. And uh, very famously, it involved um, the sharpness, so curvature terms and things like that. Um, right, but if you have a difference in lambda, then that term takes precedence um, because of effects like this. Um, okay. Uh, right. Uh, also, just to mention that the, the, the log sum apps um, uh, approximation is happening. So it's, this, is, this is always exponentially suppressed in, in, uh, in, di in the difference of free energy, right? But the, the effects in N is slightly different. Okay, so now once you have done this kind of cross-graining, um, you, you now have a different kinds of distribution. It's a distribution over states or distribution of the, over the coarse grain states, right? So it's the, the probability of um, your state being in one of these partition um, is equal to, what well, is equal to the uh, integral of the posterior over that partition, right? And um, the calculation we just done is, um, is giving us this um, formula. Uh, Due to, okay, let's talk about the next slide. I stole this from Dan. So cost graining, this is a little bit like, so for those of you who have looked at sort of renormalization in physics, um, this is a little bit reminiscent of, of, of that. You have your original system where the state is W, um, and after cost graining, you don't refer to W anymore, you refer to bulk of W, uh, which is indexed by uh, the Greek le letter that we were talking about just now. And uh, in the original system, you have energy, um, or in physics lingo, uh, the Hamiltonian, given by NLN. Um, in the cost grain version, you are, so you are talking about um, uh, Fn's, which is your effective potential. Like that's the potential that chemists care about um, when working in, uh, atmospheric condition at room temperature, for example. Um, and therefore you change your Boltzmann distribution uh, correspondingly as well. Okay, um, uh, one comment on that though is that um, I, um, although, so in renormalization theory, you, usually, you, you, you have your original system, you perform some cost graining and you come up with uh, a new system and the equation looks the same. <laughs> and then you can apply that again and again. I, uh, it's an open problem and an interesting problem in SLT um, to be able to do the next step in a consistent way. Because what happens if we do, do, do the next, uh, do the same procedure again, 
on this level, well, uh, if, we, if we always assume compactness um, and our alpha, um, you, you have a partition, you drop to the subcover, and then your alpha is a, con <laughs> is a, is a finite set. You can't continue this um, things, open problems. Okay, right, so with cost graining, we can un uh, ask the, the, the question, we can give uh, operational uh, definitions of what Bayesian phase transitions are. We can say that it is a sudden jump in posterior concentration from being concentrated in one W alphas to being concentrated in another um, uh, W, let's say W beta, as uh, some so control parameter. Like sort of yep. Yeah, we have been through this. Okay, so um, so the question of what 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 what, are, what phases are at the moment is pick your cost graining, pick pick your partitioning, right? And uh, it depends on uh, what question you. Your partition could depend on what question you want to ask. Um, the questions should be questions that you don't care exactly where in the partitions you are in. So for example, um, water is wet, uh, H2O. You, can ask, you, you, you can't ask that question because it doesn't make sense for a single molecule of H2O. Um, so, Bayesian, um, so we've talked about internal model selections. Um, that process of selecting um, at the cost grain level. Um, if we are forced to pick only one phase among all of them, the dogma and uh, the dogma is to pick, pick, pick the one that maximizes free energy, uh, sorry, minimize free energy, meaning maximize the, the Zn, meaning maximize the marginal likelihood, um, which is a way to, uh, which is kind of like saying that you are doing MLE, maximum likelihood estimation, um, on the cost grain uh, level. And sidebar opinion uh, time, I kind of think that's kind of a better picture of what SGD is doing than actual MLE in uh, in the or, in the original W space. I like how you somehow found a way to say MLE is correct. Yeah. These phases are not sharply defined. Yeah, I think, I think these questions are better revisited. I mean, Edmund's going to explain like in intricate detail, I presume, like in TMS, exactly how this manifests and after. So it's sort of, yeah. yeah. It's, at this abstract level, it's sort of hard to say sensible. Yeah. Okay. So um, we need to generate from th that bunch of maths something that is testable and that we can do experiment in. Um, so, so. One prediction is that and in singular models, uh, phases can, so uh, one of the W alpha can appear to dominate the posterior for some range of n, and then sort of go out of fashion, like just get dominated by, by other things. So you, you see, enough, um, see enough data that you no longer believe um, uh, what you believed before. Um, the free energy formula, sorry, I um, shortened it. The, the free energy formula, FEF, can give a quantitative, quantitative prediction about um, which phase is dominant. So you use that expansion, and um, if you know the, the coefficients, if you know the delta L, delta lambdas, um, or the, the Ls and lambdas, the energy and, and complexity, um, then you can make quantitative prediction about these, and roughly where not only which phase is dominant at what end, um, rough, and also roughly where the transition um, might occur. Um, Okay, so to test them, uh, I think as we have, um, to, to test them, we actually need a model um, that I mentioned this morning. We need a model with kind of the, not only do we need to have theoretical access, can compute L, can compute the learning coefficient, uh, we need those to be uh, experimentally um, legible. Okay, um, so yeah, so, uh, this is not sort of a tautological um, thing to go out and test uh, because maybe SLT doesn't apply. Maybe there are some assumptions in SLT, for example, analyticity um, that makes SLT not apply to some, um, to some models like this. Uh, maybe the, uh, the free energy formula um, 
the expansion, you need to go down to uh, high order terms. Um, the error in the asymptotic expansion uh, actually matters um, for the range of n that we, we, we care about. Uh, maybe, the, maybe phase transition are not important uh, effects um, of learning, maybe. Um, also, we need an experimental um, setting where we can actually have a grasp of the posterior, where MCMC actually works. Um, as far as I know, um, empirical tests of these predictions um, hasn't been done on um, models other than uh, models where we, for the few models that we know the RLCT of. One of them is normal mixture model. So this is a, a figure, figure 9.3 from the Green Book. Um, yeah, um, from the Green Book where um, we see sort of um, the, the error goes between two different regimes um, when, uh, for, for, for different range of n. Can you say what those are? If this, like, where, is one of these the truth? Or the Talk to me afterwards. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, so we'll focus on R2C6. Um, we can do all of that for TMS. Uh, the critical points are regular polygons. The, we actually have an uh, English de de uh, description of what the critical points are. Um, asterisk, asterisk, because it's not as simple. Um, and we can actually um, n uh, uh, because of the, the high stru highly structured um, form of these critical points, we can actually have local coordinates so that we can compute the RLCT. So, Lots of hard work that I'm not going to go into um, that uh, John Tiang, one of, uh, one of the authors, have uh, meticulously calculated these. And for R2C6, okay, don't be intimidated. Um, uh, these are the critical points that we have found, right? These, um, the, so the nice thing is that we get a very clean definition. So in TMS, we get a, as clean a definition of phase as we get. By definition, I mean, I mean it operationally in, in the sense that we can actually talk about these things as objects and talk about, um, uh, ask questions about these phases. Um, for example, um, when is it dominant? Um, and we can observe effects um, from them. Um, we can actually conflate um, the idea of phases with critical points um, in TMS. And furthermore, um, these critical points have very, this, this, the, the critical points, the phases of TMS um, is, is e very easily described. It's characterized by three quantum numbers. Um, that's tongue in cheek, uh, but just three discrete numbers. So if you know uh, for each of these, you can describe them with three numbers, three positive integers, K, k gone, the number of edges of vertices in, in, um, in the regular polygon that it forms. It has to be regular, so therefore it has to be convex. Um, sigma is the number of positive uh, values in the bias uh, vector. It's a bit hard to see because these values need to be at some exact particular value. So the green ones are positive bias values. Um, so, and those positive one needs to occur at specific um, uh, coordinate, uh, specific index. Um, that, so, so there are some constraint. So not all, just like the usual quant uh, chemistry quantum numbers, these numbers have some constraints. Um, phi is a number of large negative value in the bias. So um, it is those that are, um, heuristically it's those that are larger than the length of those factors. Okay, you don't need to actually um, understand and be able to um, um, predict the classification of these things. I say them because uh, just to show that we can, right? There is a way to give me a, uh, if you give me a parameter, if you give me a WMB, I can tell you um, which phase it is in. So it is now, uh, now we can actually talk about the W alphas with names and with the ability to put um, parameters into them. Yes. I don't know if it's true to say that we can put like any any parameterization into a phase, right? Like especially if you think like very early on when it's something from posterior like twenty k points or something, it could be something else. 
for the point is like actually because you're going to concentrate things around political points. Yep. They're different enough that in practice, when we do MCMs, when we when we start from the posterior after enough data points, it's not ambiguous. Yes. So that's a that's a that's a good point. Um, it is not as clean as I try to make uh, I make it up to be. They are so these first of all they are not points. They are actually uh, entire critical manifold. I, I keep on using critical points because that's the familiar term. So these are actually high dimensional stuff. So for example, um, this it, it might be very apparent that um, these systems is has rotational uh, symmetry. So for each W, if you rotate it a little bit, it's it's um, it's still give you the same loss and same local structure and everything. So um, each critical point you give will make a circle at least in the parameter space. Um, so sometimes much more than a circle. Um, there's not much time left. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so uh, there is some interesting, what I will call them, phase structure that these um, critical points arrange themselves into. So this is a plot um, showing the learning coefficient, aka the complexity on the x-axis and the energy um, on the y-axis. And there is this interesting structure for this system, maybe, um, where if you increase in energy, you if you decrease in energy, you increase in complexity and vice versa. Uh, okay, so we have the theoretical values um, for, for, right, we have the theoretical values for L, lambda, and we don't actually have access to the, the next order term in the free energy expansion, the, uh, the constant term, but uh, we know for sure that it involved um, the prior. So, so maybe so um, it's C plus something else where this is um, the constant term involve some other things. So we can so for 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 the um, for the part that we know, we can control what the difference in the constant term is. That called that, let's call that P, the prior term. So um, the hope is that knowing that part enough. Uh, knowing the part, um, controlling for the, 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 the prior part means that um, the variation means that when you take the difference, the, the rest doesn't uh, matter as much. Comment for the, the high level things you're going to say, in this wiggly point here is not that important. The point is, we have access to all three terms. <laughs> Okay, so you can plot um, what we call the occupancy curves across all n. So look, uh, think of this as a function of n. For, for each phase alpha, you know the fraction, the theoretical fraction that, we, that, that that phase can occur. And you plot that over uh, n. So, and this is the result. So for instance, we know that, we know that the six gone, six gone has um, lowest energy, but highest complexity. But lowest energy means that it will eventually dominate. It, will, it has the lowest uh, leading order term. So for large M, it will e eventually dominate. And that's what we see um, in the occupancy curve. We can test that against uh, empirical MCMC. So you sample from the posterior, you run MCMC, you generate a bunch of samples from the posterior, you put each of those samples into W alphas, you classify them into W alphas and plot the relative frequency. This is the result. Um, so I'm going to look, uh, mention just one salient fi uh, feature, which is um, the, the, rough the rough critical uh, data set size where the crossover of five and six gone phase um, where that occur is roughly where um, the theory predicts, roughly around 600. Um, what could, um, so as Jake has mentioned, there's a lot of uh, caveats to this. Um, the classification is not perfect. So if you have, um, so let me, can I click? No. 
Um, oops, sorry, uh, maybe don't do that. So um, that is a visualization tool uh, for, the, uh, for the posterior samples. Um, for, so it's a bad UI, but you know. <laughs> no. Um, sorry. Uh, come on. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, it's, it's not very visible, is it? Um, okay, so this is, this is what the posterior looks like when you TSNE project it down to two dimensions. Um, and this is at a training data set size of four, 400, where, um, where the, the, the effects Jake was mentioning, meaning your posterior is not sufficiently concentrated yet. Um, meaning if you take a partition, a lot of your sample will actually be near the boundary of this partition where the precise way you, you, you carve it out actually matters. Um, so you, you see a lot of, um, so you see a lot of wacky stuff, right? So this is, um, a, a, lot, a lot of these uh, samples are not actually near the critical uh, manifold. Um, and you also have, um, uh, different phases starting to mix with each other. But if you, um, okay, let me just go back. Um, when you say posterior samples, do you mean samples of the weight space? Using the no, MCMC. Oh, um, MCMC, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, okay. The, but samples from the posterior no, it's uh, itself. Samples, okay. Yeah, actual samples from the posterior. Projected to 2D using TSN. Projected to 2D using TSN, yes. Yeah. For, the, for the whole weight, yeah. from the whole weight. For the both W and B, yes. So eighteen dimensional space to two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so so um, for for low N um, things is a little bit mixed, um, but for high N you will see that most samples are very close. If you visualize these samples, there are, for example, the red one is six gone. If you visualize, this, visualize that sample, it's really just a six gone. So the point here is that um, our classification is leaky. Uh, the free energy expansion um, requires lower order term for low N. But you, if you do, your due, um, do some due diligence and check um, for outliers, um, we see that this is surprisingly um, good. Yes? We yep. like the clusters. And the point is, for each sample, we like use our classification to decide which thing we want to call it. And you can see when it is 300, like our classification doesn't seem to be like really capturing what's going on. Right? Or something. Yeah. Like, so by the end, there's like a neat clustering into like really two different types of things and we can characterize them properly. Or can you briefly say what you have to do with the metric? You said you have to do um, well, you so you mod out the symmetries that you know uh, uh, exist, uh, yeah. And then, and then you get two distinct basins, and then this is the projection of these two distinct basins. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, because otherwise if there's like rotation, it's going to be yeah, like different, different things. Mess. But actually, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, so one salient point is, is, is that uh, when we say something is a k-gon, um, these are actually sort of destroying manifold. Um, so it's, it's not really just pick a box and that's your phases. So this, class, this definition of phases is or, has already some nuance. Um, is, it, is it correct that they're connected, that, that you can go from one to the other, or is this just an uh, artifact of projecting? It's an artifact of projecting. Well, so, yeah. so, so you look at the phases that are like, you look at these points that are like halfway between them, especially in like yeah. n equals 700, there are some points right in the middle, and they really do look like they're Yeah, so they're these, uh, okay. yeah, these five are, gone. They're, more, they're still more separate, separated than they look. Yeah. In high dimensional space, yes. Yeah, I'll just like most of the points. That Talk later. <laughs> well, we'll discuss um, a, a lot of that later with a lot of questions. Uh, I say pause of questions. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. So the so next thing that we will uh, talk about very uh, uh, quickly is uh, dynamical phase transition. So the thing that we'll talk about just now has, has been predicted, uh, has been written about uh, Watanabe has say that that should occur based on the free energy formula 
uh, for a long time, uh, those have solid um, mathematical structures. But now we're talking about dynamical phase transitions, and we have a lot of questions about like SGD versus uh, Bayesian um, learning. Um, here's some experimental um, facts to help you ground um, when you are thinking about questions like that. Okay, same system, run a bunch of SGD trajectories, and so the, the animation just now goes through something that we call uh, four plus plus minus to four plus and two to five gone. That's what the anim uh, animation that you was, you, was, you was seeing just now. Um, so that's a foregone, that's a foregone, different foregone actually, and it goes to five gone, right? If you do a lot of them and you see that every one of them plateaus um, at known critical points, at those critical points that we, we, um, we have classified, Many of them get stuck at the first critical point they find. Some of them, um, not, some of them transition to lower um, energy critical points. Question, so do these plateaus, which we shall henceforth name dynamical phases, just operationally, um, have anything to do with Bayesian phases? Yes, just there's something to do with phases because they are all controlled by um, the k-gons. Why? Because the k-gons are critical points. And we know that critical points are important is the organizing principles in dynamical systems. Um, uh, so you, if you know where the critical points are in your loss landscape, and they, uh, they are the important thing to tell you the behavior um, of your trajectory. Re um, I'm going to leave it at that. That's a picture from Gilmore. You can, we can talk about that uh, if you want to afterwards. But the difficult question is, okay, we know there's something that they, 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 they are governed by the same thing, but how? Um, how are they affect? Are they affect differently by, uh, by, by different features of the critical points? Don't know. Okay, if you insist. <laughs> Um, okay, if SGD learning is equal to Bayesian learning macroscopically, what, I, what do I mean by that is that they are, um, let's say, so let's put some high level hypothesis up here, um, that both dynamical and Bayesian learning um, agree at the phase level um, or um, Okay, not, uh, as Dan already mentioned, not all uh, allowed phase, phase transition in a Bayesian sense is, um, can, can happen dynamically, but, dynam let's, but it is not un unreasonable to think that dynamical ones are supported by Bayesian ones. So if, that, uh, if a dynamical one occur, then the Bayesian one have to allow it to occur. So we call that the Bayesian antecedent. So if you, a dynamical, um, transition can occur, then we are hypothes hypothesizing that there exists a, a, the, same, the same Bayesian phase transition from the same phase between those same phase can occur as supported by the free energy formula of those two phases. So operationally in TMS, um, um, if you find a dynamical transition that has a sharp drop in loss, then it it, you are required to have a Corresponding increase in complexity. Um, Five yep, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the next one. Um, so, so sh shouldn't there be a relation between the transition probabilities that you see in this dynamical system and the occupation uh, mm -hmm. uh, probabilities that you could do better? Yes, so the hypothesis that, that is put forward here is only at a quant qualitative level. Um, so the, if, if we go down to the sort of probability of occupation or probability of escape uh, once you are in, in, in a phase, that we haven't probed, but it is uh, an interesting question. Also, how does the ethic we should? Uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it afterwards with, in the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, okay, a another hypothesis is that if you, if, you're, if you have multiple dynamical phase transition, then, and, and each of them is supported by the corresponding 
Bayesian transition. And if, that, if the dynamical transition occur in that order, the Bayesian transition should occur in that order too. It's a hypothesis that's tested in TMS. So what we see in TMS is that, um, so hypothesis number one is satisfied for this particular um, trajectory. So when you're lost, so blue is, blue, uh, blue is a lost curve. At, um, so these dots correspond to these pictures, um, the red dots. So there you are in a foregone phase, uh, four plus plus minus gone, and you transition to, you drop in loss, and you drop in loss again. And the, com the, the complexity uh, estimate, which we'll talk about uh, later in the week, is an estimate that curve, it's a complexity curve, goes up uh, when the loss drops. There is another measure of complexity that is quite visual as well. You grow a leg, right, for example. That's like, between these two things, you would need to know about the, 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 <laughs> the, the classification there. Okay. Okay. Um, you can comment on the double transition if you want. Yep, okay. So, for, for the, so this is an example where there is a double transition. Um, one, two. And these are the, these are the um, free energy curve, just the first three terms. Um, so NL plus lambda log N plus C for those three phases as a function of N. So if you look at the um, curve, uh, if, if you look at the selection process, let's say we are at N equal to 150, the dogma says that you, you, you choose the one with the lowest free energy, you choose the phase with the lowest free energy, and then look at that, that's the four plus plus minus. You go out a little bit, you, it, it says that four plus should be, dominate, uh, should, should be dominating um, uh, afterwards, and then finally five will dominate, right? Theoretically. Sorry? Theoretically. Yeah, theoretically. And we do see that with um, uh, in the dynamical um, version, empirically. What are the Yep, what are the Rayleigh Because these, um, uh, the lambdas, are actually estimated lambdas, and that's the error bar for the, for the lambda. These are, yes, empirical variance of the estimated lambda. The theoretical free energy is using an empirically estimated lambda. The theoretical asymptotic formula for the free energy is using an empirically estimated uh, second order terms, log n term. Don't like bet your children on this graph where you can yeah. see the yeah. phases, but it's like suggested. Yeah, so um, uh, yeah. one very important point is that um, these, you should, we should be putting our experimentalist hat on. Uh, these are, we are testing a particular hypothesis that that wasn't falsified in this system yet. So go forth and do more tests in more diverse um, scenario. Okay, skipping that. Um, Dan talked about this uh, this morning. Um, that's, that's the, uh, so I show you one example and this is the, the ensemble example where that, that says that for the transitions and multiple transitions that, that we have seen, both hypotheses are not falsified um, for TMS R2C6, also for R2C5 and C4. Um, right, so it's not falsified yet. Do that later. Okay, uh, I'm ending in the next five minutes, so just, just that's the end of the precise stuff and some hand waving. Um, I want to make a distinction between uh, mechanistic versus thermodynamic claim. So um, we are making a lot of claims um, for this system. And a lot of the claim for the specific TMS system comes from higher level so, uh, thermodynamical expectation. So it comes from SLT, which is kind of a general theory. So there are claims that are sort of mechanistic, meaning it depends on the idiosyncrasy of the model. Um, and uh, and there are general thermodynamical claims that should generalize to other learning systems. Um, th the mechanistic claims are hard to verify in large systems, 
easy to verify in small systems, for example, R266 TMS. But thermodynamic claims in, for thermodynamic claims, usually it's bigger, the better, right? The bigger, the, the, the better the predictions are. Um, so uh, example um, that we talk about today, which is like uh, allow thermodynamic uh, transition need not occur. For example, you can super cool um, water, even though below certain temperature, um, your thermodynamic says that it has to turn, turn into water, but it doesn't. It needs nucleation and things like that. Um, but the thermodynamics is explaining that you can call it sub-cool uh, sub -cool or superheat in the first place. Like it's your, there is an expectation that it should be in some phase, but there are some mechanistic details that make it, that, that, that is preventing things. Um, mechanistic things, if you want to uh, interpret things mechanistically, there are, um, there, there's a uh, complication where you don't know which detail matters. Um, but for thermodynamics properties, proper claims that are thermodynamical, only properties that survive the cost graining uh, should matter. Um, okay, so in our system, k gons is a critical point. k gons are regular k gons are critical points. It's a mechanistic claim. We don't don't go and find uh, regular polygons in large language uh, language models, um, but go and test whether or not posterior concentrates in neighborhoods of critical points of other learning systems. Yeah, we, um, we should be using things that we know mechanistically to test the laws, as we did with TMS, of, of test all the thermodynamical claims. But ultimately, once you have uh, figured out that something is a law, you should use it to uh, detect whether or not interesting mechanism is happening. So for our system, that phase structure of TMS that going up in energy means going down in complexity, that statement, which one is it? Is it because it, it is, is it just because this is a toy model or superposition system? It's just how it is arranged? Or is that a more general thing where phase structure or some feature of that uh, arrangement is more general in, in nature, say? What about the Bayesian antecedent hypothesis? Is that actually true as a thermodynamical law in general? The answer to the question should be the second principle of thermodynamics, right? Say that again? The second principle of thermodynamics. The second principle, do you mean the entropy increases? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you go higher in temperature, you should go uh, towards more disorder, so less complexity. If you interpret the complexity of the... Right, yes, yeah, that... that. <laughs> Yes, that, that is why we, 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 uh, we were surprised, I'm not surprised, pleasantly surprised by that structure in the first place because thermodynamics does tell us that we should expect something like that. Um, yeah. Okay. It's K-gon for TMS for two-dimensional toy model superposition. Other than that, I don't know. It's an it's, it's a open, open problem. Uh, unless a physicist want to say. Maybe the, the stable basis of the, the basis of the fraction of the group of points would be the definition of the phase that you can use in general. Yeah, so that would be... Even if the medical point is not... Yeah, we need to wrap up. Okay. Um, Okay, so there are other problems with, for example, we, are only, we care only about sort of, um, when we talk about local dynamics, what about global dynamics? Is, it, is SGD sensitive to your stochastic, uh, precise configuration of a stochastic optimizer? Um, um, so you have a Bayesian uh, theory where um, it doesn't care about dynamical thing. And then you have SG, uh, so it doesn't care about moment to moment evolution of your, of your learning system. And then you have SGD, which care maximally about that. Is there something in between where um, you, you, you care about like changing things um, using a jargon quasi statically? Um, maybe we don't care about phases, we care more about fa phase transitions. Uh, can we detect them in larger system? Um, many other questions. Yep, that's, uh, I'm done.